Okay, last week we examined the relationship between pain and language by applying theories from Elaine Scarry's The Body in Pain to Oliver Sacks' The Case of the Colorblind Painter. Now, this week we're going to be beginning a new unit and we're going to start by looking at um, two different works. Um, the first is the introduction to the Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, which is a catalog of, um, of the experience of um, people in medieval Florence dealing with an outbreak of the Black Death in 1348. The next work is John Donne's Emotion Upon, um, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, which is the author's autobiographical account um, of an illness that he had, and that work was published in 1623. So this is the beginning of a historical examination of illness. Um, and by this, um, we're going to be looking at how people historically have um, thought and written about pain, illness, and medical treatment. Um, now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, or go back to, I should say, um, the kind of analytic levers that we can use. If you'll recall, we had talked about the idea from the very first week that literature exists on two levels, the denotative level and the connotative level. We have three different methodological levers that we can use to understand a text connotations. We can use close reading, theory, and historical or cultural information. Last week, what we did was we used theory, that is Elaine Scarry's theory, um, as a lens to think about Oliver Sacks' work. And then we discussed that work by using close reading. This week, we're going to be using historical and cultural information um, as a lens to understand Boccaccio and Dunn. And we're going to actually be using close reading in order to then more closely examine those two works. So we're uh, combining two different methodological tools, um, that is um, history and then also close reading. Um, so we're going to begin by um, with just some general facts for talking about um, the history of medicine and illness in the pre-modern and early modern era, that is in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. Um, in general, I like to give people this advice when they are um, interpreting historical literary works. The first is to annoy, avoid anachronisms. An anachronism is an idea, an object, or a phenomenon from our own time period that doesn't actually exist historically. And the second idea is to avoid ethical judgments about what you're reading. And I'll give you an example to show, to show you what I'm talking about. If you look at the image on the right hand side of the slide, um, you'll notice that it looks like a man wearing a bird mask. Um, it's actually a print from the Renaissance, from the early modern period. And it's an image of a doctor and he is um, actually wearing a mask and holding what looks like some kind of like spear or something on the end of it. Um, that's actually um, probably some kind of flower um, arrangement to provide better smells for him. And the mask is to keep him from inhaling strange vapors. So if we were gonna avoid anachronisms, what we wouldn't wanna say is that is a mask to help him avoid germs. That doctor has no idea about germs. He doesn't think in those terms. So to say that about that piece is not going to be accurate. Similarly, we would want to avoid ethical judgments about the kind of culture that produced this kind of an image that would have produced that bird mask um, as cutting edge technology to fight an illness. I mean, it looks incredibly naive, it looks silly. Um, but to the individuals that were on the front lines of medical care in the Renaissance, this was their one defense. This is something that they valued very highly. So when we read historical works, I oftentimes encourage students to think of themselves as being anthropologists. Um, when anthropologists go to study another culture, they try and withhold judgment as much as possible. They try and examine that culture in its own terms in order to understand that culture's values, that culture's education, um, that culture's religion, the things that help individuals in that culture order their universe. And um, I would suggest doing the same thing when we read um, works of historical literature. All right, so here's some very general facts to give you um, just a kind of 
um, overview background in the um, medical system and the experience of medicine in pre-modern and early modern eras in, um, in England and in Europe. I think it's helpful here for us to actually um, compare um, our own system to a system that was in place hundreds of years ago. And I think the process of doing that will help to um, defamiliarize what um, we think of as being something that is completely natural or is not something we even think about when we think about medical treatment and medical illness. Um, the first is when we imagine the kinds of groups that we rely on to help people um, recover from illnesses, that is to help diagnose an illness, ameliorate it, and deal with its aftermaths. Um, the first is of these kind of institutions that we rely on is the government, um, for us the federal government and also the state government. Um, we also rely on medical practitioners and we rely on researchers. So here's some of the groups or, um, or some of what I mean by these different groups. On the left hand side is the government. We rely on the U.S. government to help fund research. Um, we rely on them to provide insurance. And we rely on them to administer public health institutions like the CDC and the WHO. In terms of our practitioners, we rely on doctors, nurses, mental health workers, um, EMTs, nurses, aides, PTs, OTs, um, and groups of people that help to describe illness and get it properly, um, pro properly covered by insurance. And then in terms of researchers, we rely on um, epidemiologists, biologists, pharmaceutical researchers, um, MD-PhDs, RN-PhDs, and a whole host of other researchers that are looking to find new illnesses and catalog them and then to treat them. Now, if we go back to the pre-modern and early modern era, some of these general institutions do exist. They are very different than what we think. First of all, um, illnesses were really treated at a population-wide level. Um, through bureaucratic institutions. Um, in um, pre-modern, early modern England, for example, it would have been local civil government, um, you know, setting up things like supply chains or creating mandates for how bodies should be handled if they were ill or quarantining people. And then in terms of just overall aid, local churches also helped out as well. And in fact, in early modern church, early modern England, excuse me, the local church actually functions as a social service um, wing in the very same way that, um, you know, that, that we have a whole host of, um, of social services through our government as well. Those just happen to get provided through the church. So that's on sort of the population-wide level. On the individual level, we have medical practitioners, um, just as we do today. Um, they fall into fewer categories, and the categories are slightly different than what we have. Um, they have doctors and surgeons. In the pre-modern and early modern era, doctors and surgeons were considered two completely different professions. They had completely different trainings. Doctors were held in much higher regard than surgeons were. Um, surgeons were regarded more as kind of practical, um, kind of practical thinkers or kind of practical um, practitioners. Um, doctors were sort of more theoretical. They were more trained. Um, and doctors did internal medicine things. Surgeons did anything related to, um, to surgery, obviously. In addition, we had midwives. Midwives helped to provide um, women's care, um, in particular the care of childbirth and postpartum care. And there were also apothecaries. Apothecaries are pre-modern and early modern pharmacists. And those pharmacists um, might actually come in and help treat someone, um, you know, they could do everything from diagnose and treat sort of low-level illnesses, or they might diagnose and treat illnesses for patients that were really um, poor and couldn't afford a doctor, um, or they might just provide um, just provide medications for um, for the doctor to fulfill the doctor's orders. All right, in terms of pre-modern and early modern medical knowledge and training, um, most medical knowledge was for doctors was based on the writings of Greek and Roman philosophers like Galen, like Asclepius, and like Hippocrates. Um, and this sort of older knowledge held that many illnesses were caused by an imbalance of four bodily humors. And therefore the role of the doctor was to rebalance those humors. You guys might've heard about how doctors historically <coughs> used to bleed patients. That was a practice because it was thought that um, if a patient's humors were out of 
whack, if there was too much blood, then if you um, bled the patient, that it would restore that balance between the patient's blood and the other humors. Now, that's only for some illnesses. Um, on top of that, there is an idea that some illnesses um, do occur, not because of humors, but because someone has been exposed to something. Um, but the mechanism of exposure is thought to be usually like vapors or drafts, um, sort of air that, that carries an illness. There's actually no understanding of germ theory in the early modern and pre-modern era, and you can't have a germ theory until you have a microscope capable of seeing microbes. That doesn't really come about, I believe, until the um, like 17th and 18th century, and the idea of germ theory is certainly not popularized even in the 18th century. Um, in addition, because there's no germ theory, there's a different set of medical hygiene practices um, than we would find today. You know, um, doctors and practitioners certainly were interested in, um, you know, in hygienic practices, but they don't really believe in um, things like creating sterile equipment, um, sterilizing um, the environment, or even, let's say, like washing their hands. Those kinds of things aren't really kind of widely practiced. And the last thing is that um, when you read about illnesses, um, diseases and illnesses in the pre-modern, early modern eras and the 18th century, um, are often described and understood in terms of symptoms. By this, I mean that writers certainly understood um, that certain diseases had names like gout, um, plague, and, um, and leprosy. But oftentimes, those names applied to multiple illnesses. So gout might apply to any variety of illnesses, including things from like a bad stomach ache to what we would think of as gout, which is pain, which might be like defined by pain in, um, in your big toe. And then in addition to that, other illnesses are really described by, by their symptoms. So doctors will talk about patients having like an infectious fever or a fever with, um, you know, with feelings of lassitude or something. And that ill is actually the illness. Okay, in terms of medical treatment, because medicine is thought of and conceptualized in such different ways, there's completely different treatments as well. First of all, there's no antibiotics and antiretrovirals, um, or I'm sorry, um, antivirals. Um, there's also no antiretrovirals. Um, patients were given medications. Sometimes they were given cordials or, um, you know, any like variety of concoctions, um, and they were certainly bled. Um, we know that surgeons could do any variety of surgical procedures, but when it came to illnesses, from our perspective, doctors and pharmacists primarily offered um, pre-modern or early modern patients um, what we would call like supportive care to ameliorate symptoms. Um, the other thing is that there are hospitals in this period, but they don't really treat everyone. Um, your, um, where you get treated depends on how much money you have, really, and how much family you have, and what your illness is. So wealthy patients tend to get treated at home, um, you know, as much as possible. Hospitals are often run um, through churches, um, especially in Europe. Um, they tend to treat patients that don't have family members, that don't have um, enough money to afford, like, a servant to stay home with them. Um, or for patients that are suffering from like an epidemic. So something like patients that have the plague might end up at a hospital. And then finally, let's think about the consequences of illness in the early modern and pre-modern era, given what we know about training and the availability of um, treatments. First, we know that, you know, patients got sick, but that, you know, even if you got an infectious, you know, bacterial infection, you could recover from it without um, antibiotics. It might take a long time, um, but you could do it, but not everyone recovers from infections and certainly not at the same rate that we see today. Um, they just didn't have treatments for a lot of infections. Um, and you know the best way to not get it is avoidance. Um, patients that did get infections, that didn't die, oftentimes suffer long-term consequences of their illnesses. Those might include, but like not be limited to things like scars. Um, in the 18th century, people were really concerned about um, like the terrible scarring that would occur from smallpox if you survived. Um, 
in addition, patients might suffer damage resulting from that illness. So for example, smallpox, um, even if you didn't get scarring, smallpox can cause blindness. Or if a patient has rheumatic fever, um, that can cause lifelong heart problems. And those consequences would have might have dramatically changed patients' lives. Um, and the third thing is that an illness might actually um, end up becoming recurrent because it's not treated. It might be recurrent over a series of weeks or recurrent over a series of months. Um, but you know, patients do talk about kind of recurring, um, recurring infections that they're suffering from. Um, and the last point is that you know, I certainly because you know because so many patients died. I think that pre-modern and early modern. Um, people tended to really value good health um, and really think of people that had good health as being really fortunate um, in a way that I think maybe we don't think of today because, um, you know, treatments and what we would think of as sort of cures really kind of seem to be something that we've come to expect that's just not expected in these earlier periods. All right, so let's turn from talking generally about um, the history of illness and its treatment to thinking specifically about um, our authors. The rest of this presentation is gonna talk about Giovanni Boccaccio, who was um, an Italian author. He lived um, actually all over Italy, but in particular in Ravenna, um, Florence, and uh, Naples. And he lived from 1313 to about 1375. Um, now the Decameron, um, the introduction that I had you guys read is the first story and what is actually a hundred different stories. Um, it was completed in about 1353. So a little information on Boccaccio himself. He was the illegitimate son of a wealthy Florentine baker, I'm sorry, excuse me, banker. And he was raised in that banker's household. Um, he was very well educated. He was well traveled. Uh, despite his father's wishes that he go into the banking profession, he um, really wanted to be a professional writer and scholar. Um, and after sort of six years of an apprenticeship in a bank, followed by a few more years of studying law to no avail, he did end up becoming a writer. Um, and his own work helped to elevate um, prose fiction, which is basically what we think of as fiction um, or novels. Um, he helped to elevate it as a form of what we would call kind of belle lettre, as being um, a kind of literary art form. And as a writer, he's um, very careful. He's, he's very literary as a writer. And what I want us to think about in his introduction is not only how he's recording the experience of the Black Death, but also um, the way in which he is using um, the plague as a literary device to help set up his work. So the introduction um, to the Decameron is meant as an impetus for all the stories. He catalogs um, the plague of 1348. And what we haven't read is that he um, represents that there's this group of young persons who, um, who are from Florence that decide that they are going to escape the havoc that the plague has wrought. And to amuse one another, they're each going to tell a different story. And so the stories are supposed to sort of meant to sort of amuse and kind of instruct people, but mostly to amuse them. So let's think a little bit about the Black Death um, in Florence in 1348. Um, I'm sure you guys know about the Black Death from maybe your history classes. We know that it swept across Europe. Here's how it impacted Florence. Um, historians estimate that the outbreak of the plague in 1348 in Florence probably killed either two thirds to three quarters of the population. Now, Florence had 100,000 residents approximately which means that about 67,000 to 75,000 um, members of that community died. Um, now, we also know that Boccaccio probably wasn't living in Florence in 1348, despite the narrator's assurance in that introduction that he is witnessing everything that's going on. Um, we think that he may have actually been in another city, but his family lived in Florence. And so he most likely got his information about what was going on in Florence during the outbreak of, um, of the plague from his father, who was the Florentine minister of supply. So was really at the front lines of um, the bureaucratic institutions 
that were ensuring that there was adequate food supplies and that hygiene practices and quarantine practices were being followed. And Boccaccio himself lost friends and family members in that outbreak of the plague. Um, in particular, his, um, his stepmother actually passed away um, from, uh, from the plague that year. All right. Um, so all this is to say is that Boccaccio is writing about a historical event and he's pretending to be a kind of eyewitness in the narrative, but he's also using that narrative as a kind of literary device. So we have to really think of that narrative as always um, having to balance itself between the literary and the historical. I'm going to give you a little bit more historical information about the plague, um, and then I um, want to start thinking about the literary aspect of the, um, of the introduction. All right, so what he's describing, as I said, is the Black Death, which was the outbreak of what we've come to know as bubonic plague. Um, bubonic plague is a bacterial infection. It's actually treatable today with antibiotics. Um, its mode of transmission is that it's carried by fleas that have been infected, um, and those fleas tend to live on mice or rats, um, and then the fleas bite people, and that's how people get sick. Um, now, of course, no one knew this when Boccaccio was writing. Um, they know that what's going on is an epidemic. They know that it's spreading really quickly. They're not quite sure how. They know that it comes when people are kind of in proximity to one another. Now, some of the ways in which, or I should say, cities themselves become um, sort of ripe breeding ground for the widespread, um, for a like, widespread outbreak of plague. Um, and it has to do with the way the cities are structured. Um, the houses are really close together. Oftentimes, those houses um, and the community has like rat problems or mice problems. Um, so there's just sort of mice and rats that are in close proximity to people. Um, and so uh, in addition, like clothing and bedding is really expensive in these days um, in these days because it has to be handmade. So clothing and bedding gets passed from one person to another. Um, and so it's, you know, it becomes a kind of easy way for fleas to get transmitted, um, which is why uh, the plague seems to be easily transmitted from household to household um, in this particular outbreak. Again, there's no, no germ theory. So, you know, Boccaccio doesn't really kind of, you know, understand the etiology of the Black Death in the way that we as modern people do. The way that he describes its etiology um, is geographical. He thinks it comes from another place, or he knows that it comes from another place. And so he's seeing that place as being an origin, an origin point for the Black Death. Um, what he does know about the illness is he knows what its symptoms look like. Um, he knows it um, can't really be effectively treated, and he knows that it will very likely result in death. And what the introduction does is it creates this impression of a well-ordered and very civilized society that pretty much descends into kind of anarchy because of um, this pestilence. So what the plague does is it reverses the values and trends by which Florence defined itself. And so what I want us to do um, is to think about the ways in which um, what Decameron is cataloging is how the epidemic destroys the social fabric of Florence. What does it mean to have one's social fabric destroyed? Um, and how, like, in what ways is the Black Death impacting, um, you know, social relationships and also um, uh, cultural um, sort of cultural practices. In addition, I want you to think about how Boccaccio understands the illness's etiology and what he thinks of in terms of treatment. And the last thing that I want you to think about is why Boccaccio focuses so much attention in his text on himself as an eyewitness to what's going on, when we know that he really may or may not be an eyewitness. As a writer, what does it gain him to have a narrator who is present in Florence as this is taking place and is telling us um, this story as a kind of um, journalistic account almost. All right, these are things to um, start to think about to get you started with analysis. And I will talk to you in, um, in the next presentation about John Donne.